Hey everybody, welcome to The Bottom Line. Michael Noland here, and today I wanted to discuss my top five bass players in rock. Now, the second I decided to do a video on bass players, I knew I was in trouble, especially if I'm only going to introduce my top five favorite bass players. And a lot of my favorite bass players are not on this top five list. But you know, these are the bass players that have most influenced me, pleased me as a listener, and have done more for me in a total general musical sense than even some of the finest bass players in rock. Now I am a bit late shooting this video because just as I was ready to set this video shoot up, Guess what? I've talked about this guy before, Tudor Smith. He's a fellow channel and a fellow Beatle kind of guy. And so when he does a live setup, I always like to take some time and sign on in and say, hi, Tudor. And of course, he certainly covered a couple of my favorite songs in that video. Once again, Tudor, thanks for not guilty. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, I'm also a bassist. And so this list is very near and dear to my heart. And number five was a tough one to name. A couple of names came up, you know, uh, Pastor, Clark, Pastore, Clark, and I have to give it to Clark. Now, it's not that Stanley Clark is a better bassist, but I was introduced to him first. Return to Forever, and some of the lines, and his ability to actually jam live. Well, you all know what I feel about Led Zeppelin being a bit of a jam band themselves, always changing their material when they performed live. And you know, I think it's just the fact that Stanley Clark just opened up a whole lot for me as a musician. He introduced this whole idea of jazz, rock, fusion kind of approach to music. And so that's why I chose Stanley Clark in my top five bassist list. Up next, a bassist from one of the top bands in rock and roll, no doubt, and a man who never took a back seat even to their magnificent drummer, Mr. John N. Twistle. You know, when I think of the rhythm section of Keith Moon and John N. Twistle, any other bassist would have been buried by this drummer. But it's not only N. Twistle's ability to keep up with Moon, it's also his syncopation and his syncopation approach that really intrigued me early on. Now, I didn't even know that he could possibly play this stuff live until, of course, I saw The Who at the Cow Palace during the Quadrophenia tour. That, of course, was the infamous performance where Keith Moon passed out after getting into a tussle with one of the band members. I couldn't believe what I saw, and it was really a wild night. But you know what? What I was very impressed with that night was the punch-through sound that John N. Twistle was able to do even live filling the room with a plethora of notes in any given 16th, 30 second combination. Now, number three, of course, if you've seen any of my videos, I've just recently announced that Chris Squire from Yes is my third favorite bassist of all time. Now, I explained a lot of my reasonings in that video, but this man is a virtuoso no doubt. I also mentioned in that video that I've heard some people refer to him as a lead guitar bassist, which is ridiculous. And for a further explanation for my choice, at number three, take a look at my video introducing Yes. All right, that leads up to number two, and I haven't ever officially announced this on the channel, although I think I've hinted at it. My number two bassist of all time is Mr. John Paul Jones of Led Zeppelin. This man could play as many notes as in Twistle any day, but his mixes are often more subdued. But man, on some of their live performances, the things he does, the punch, the triplets delivered, the almost impossible bass licks to replicate. And of course, it's not just him as a bass player, but it's also the fact that he is a multi-instrumentalist. This gives him an idea of where 
instrument should fit into a mix. And as I've said many times, John Paul Jones is Led Zeppelin's secret weapon. Of course, that leads to number one, and it may not surprise any of you that I have chosen Sir Paul McCartney as my favorite bass player of all time. Now, it's not just because of his riffing capabilities, although Paul is a fine bass riffer, there is no doubt about that. But as to whether he's on the actual level of some of the bass players I've already Already mentioned, that's debatable. But I can tell you, he is an ultra fine bass player and he has done more for the instrument, the bass guitar, in pop music than any other man alive in my opinion. His melodic approach was absolutely new. And as I already expressed in my video covering their very first album, Please Please Me, that even in those very early recordings, the Beatles show that they have arrived with a completely professional bass player, top of his game, the day he walked into Abbey Road Studios. And of course, I covered five videos just covering Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And you know my feelings on how he approached almost painting his bass stroke by stroke onto that album after the fact. No, I'm sorry, Sir Paul has to be at the top of the heap and he always has been for me. Jacket was kind of hot, guys. All right, so what I wanted to do today is shoot a bit of a twofer for you, if you don't mind. For part two, I'd like you just to take yourselves back to the mid-60s. The Beatles at that time were just right at their mid-period. They had gotten through a few bumps with the album Help, almost a masterpiece, and then they presented us with two of their greatest masterpieces they ever recorded, and of course that was Rubber Soul and Revolver. Now this isn't the video that I promised you guys, that's coming next. That's my next video that I expect to film. But this is the video that sets the whole mood for it, okay? But it also gives us a moment, just to pause for a moment, and appreciate that time in music. And the term I'm going to use is that time of those jingly, jangly bands. You know, John, Paul, George, Ringo, George on his 12-string Rickenbacker. You know, I love what the Beatles did. I love that they went even further than these two albums as far as their total approach to music. But there's the small part of me, the fan of me, that almost wishes they had stayed right at this level. You know, we would have still gotten absolutely amazing new songs by Lennon and McCartney. Just imagine if they had stayed. This is a guilty pleasure, I admit, but if they had stayed at this level, there was such a magic to all the singles in those years. So here's a question for you. What are your top five favorite jingly, jangly bands. I'm gonna give you my top five and then you guys can do some thinking and let me know in the comments. All right, so seriously here. Number one would have to be the Beatles and I think you all know my reasoning behind that and I don't think there would be too many contenders for that number one spot other than the Beatles. But it's with my number two pick that you'll get a sense of where I'm going with this, okay? My number two pick would be the Yardbirds. Now think of all of their singles. They sound like they're right there in the room with you. This is the charm I hear on Rubber Soul and Revolver. Mixes, songs, performed by a limited amount of people, let's say four or five, and it just sounding like they are practicing in the garage at your neighbor's house. I love the Yardbirds, and not just because of their connection to Led Zeppelin. I loved the Yardbirds before Led Zeppelin was ever a band. I was catching up on the Yardbirds before I kind of fell into 
Led Zeppelin and of course I've explained my whole introduction to Led Zeppelin in past videos. Okay so now let's define the field a little bit further with my number three pick and that would have to be another bird band, The Birds. And of course I know I'm going to get comments that The Birds sound so much like what I'm talking about because of their 12 string Rickenbacker electric guitars and yes that is part of the sound I'm talking about. But it's not just that. You know, in Help, John was still playing a few pieces of harp. And when I think of jingly jangly bands, I like some mouth harp in there. You know what I mean? And so that leads me to number four. And this one kind of comes out of left field, but true rock fans will know exactly who I'm talking about. And that, of course, is the band The Bo Brummels. These guys always sounded like mid-period Beatles on acid and talk about haunting harmonica not shying away from the instrument thinking it was rather old-fashioned loved the Bo Brummels and so did Billy Joel now I've kind of fooled you guys you see two through four they're actually three through five I chose my last band my number two jingly jangly band of all time second only to the Beatles Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Armed with a man who could write a tune right up there with the best of the Beatles and a band that would help him along the way if he had any rough spots to figure out. And the Smarts, just like the band The Cars, to always mix their records to sound good on a four inch mono speaker in a Ford Pinto. This band always sounded sparkly to me. Even their more laid back cuts. I gotta tell you, you know, the history of the Heartbreakers, you find that Tom Petty had some difficulty finding his voice, his identity. The original band didn't have much of the sound we hear today, but boy, it was almost like he was destined to find that sound. So a big thumbs up to Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, only beat out tonight in tonight's video under tonight's conditions by the Beatles themselves. All right guys, as I've mentioned before, every once in a while I go into a multi-shoot day and today's one of those. And of course I'm right in the midst of getting ready right here, right now, to get my video on Rubber Soul and Revolver and why there is a valid connection between those two albums and the band Led Zeppelin. You know, I just want to thank everybody's response to these videos. Thank you, Tudor, for the shout out. That can only help the channel, buddy, and I appreciate it. Also here, you'll see names below me. These are brand new subscribers, folks. The channel is growing in leaps and bounds, and that can only happen by you watching and sharing our videos. So a big thank you, even if you haven't subscribed and you're an occasional viewer, wonderful. But you know, of course, if you know anybody who's interested in the best rock bands that ever freaking existed in the universe, you might consider sharing our videos. Anyway, that's me going off the rails as usual. But I do want to send, and no pun intended, out a whole lot of love to our brand new viewers. Thank you so very much. I'm also in the early researches to do a part two on my video on the Hall of Shame. You know, responses to that video have been wonderful. And you want to know something? I've even reconsidered my position. Let's bring Dolly Parton into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Let's encourage her to tell them what this really means to her. Only because she's the only one outside of rock and roll with enough rock and roll balls to tell it like it is. But you know, all joking aside, I do want to do a very serious piece on this. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame needs to be overhauled, rehauled, and changed. All right, that's it. Michael Noland here, the channel's The Bottom Line, and I'll see you in the next video.